see you all. I really miss you. <laughs> yeah. you I hope next time we will have life. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just um, take a five minutes and return. Sandhya, a big heart. Big hug. <laughs> Manoj, I feel I feel your tiredness <laughs> up on me. <laughs> this is also to be over. It's radiating. To, yeah, we're with you till the end. Don't worry. <laughs> Hello, Nathan. I I mean, how are you? Fine. How about you? Yeah, good. Good. It's a uh, kind of a busy time of term, actually. Um, so it's, it's nice to have a break from that. I kind I of been know. running around. I, it, I mean, yeah, having the having the conference video wise is great because I don't think I would have been able to to go to India. But on the yeah. other hand, I mean, I've had I'm hiding in my office because I've got two kids at home <laughs> who are just You're sort not of alone. crawling all over me. <laughs> Charlie and Dan were talking. So wow. yes, <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah. Um, how, how is the baby? It's, I mean, baby's good. Posting the pictures, she's, so she's get growing super rapidly. Yeah, yeah. She's, um, I mean, she's 14 months now. She's chatting away. She's got a really good sense of humor, which she's shown for months now. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. She's really delightful, and she's very That's calm. Something. Like her, her brother is a goofball, and that was probably <laughs> obvious <laughs> the way he was born. <laughs> And I just think like they're going to be older. They get along really well, but you can just see she's going to like have her head in her hands like all the time over things he does. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, but they'll love each but they love each other very much. They and I'm sure they'll they'll continue. Uh, hugs to her and yeah. him as well, both of them. Yeah. Okay, I'll grab a coffee and return. Okay. In a couple of seconds, sending a big hug to you. Heard. Okay, see you soon. Yeah, see you. Bye bye. Nathan? Yeah. Uh, I, during, you said you had uh, your kids crawling all over you during our talk. Is that yeah. What you said? Yeah. So, uh, so during the talk, uh, I was in the middle of my talk. What I have been announced is the, the formation of and, uh, the Deleuze studies in India collective. I looked over my computer as I'm the reading, office goes, uh, and my two cats be surprised to hear, managed uh, to find President, something uh, to George pull onto Magisa, the floor and start and the secretary, Manoj, eating and through. So I was having this one of these, I'm, I'm delivering my talk, I'm having this conversation in my head on another track. Should I get up and break this feeding frenzy up or just continue presenting my paper and, and no, I went for the professional way. side. <laughs> Good. It's a nice paper, I enjoyed it. Dan's oh, paper thank too. you.
Nivedita? Uh, yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Go. Good afternoon and good evening to one and all present here. I welcome you all to this final plenary session of the SWIFT DGSIC International Conference. So this session will be chaired by uh, Professor Sandhya Devasan. So I'll take this opportunity to introduce her. Sandhya Devasan is an academic and author based in India. She is currently assistant professor, Department of English, Jesus and Mary College, University of Delhi. Her work focuses on the conceptual history and literature and post-Kantian continental philosophy with an abiding focus on delusion Gutari. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, sorry, you just start to give me a second. I'll just need to um, get back to my notes. What I have uh, announce is the, the formation of the Deleuze Studies in India Collective. It's a new initiative. The office bearers, uh, you won't be surprised to hear, are President uh, George Vargisa and the Secretary Manoj N.Y. organizers um, on some of the, the details um, will be back in a jiffy. What I have been announced is the the formation of the Deleuze Studies in India Collective. It's a new initiative. The office bearers, uh, you won't be surprised to hear, are President uh, George Vargisa and the Secretary Manoj N.Y.
what I um welcome back everyone and sorry to keep everyone uh, waiting uh this was an inadvertent kind of a lapse um so welcome back and uh, to the last plenary session of the conference this is uh, of, uh, of of course what has been uh, an extremely exciting and brilliant you know bunch of uh, panels and and discussions and thoughts and observations across these four days um i'm i'm for sure uh, really uh, you know going back with uh, with with many uh, new ideas and and uh, lots happening up there <laughs> um so um just jumping right into the plenary session i'm i'm delighted to to uh, introduce our three speakers today um and we have alex um alex uh lee is a professor at the department of British and American Cultural Studies and is a founding director of the Center for Technology and Humanities Kyung Hee University South Korea. He was invited as a visiting professor at the Center for Culture, Media and Governance Jamia University in India and is an international or was an international visiting scholar at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities and Social Sciences National Taiwan University. He is a member of the advisory board for the International Delays and Guasari Studies in Asia. and the board member of the international consortium of critical theory and asia theories network he has edited the third volume of the idea of communism and published articles in various journals such as philos delays in guatari studies and philosophy today and chapters in the bloomsbury handbook of world theory thinking with animation and both of these are published in 2021 back to the 30s recurring crisis of uh, crises of capitalism liberalism and democracy and balibar wallerstein uh, race nation class rereading a dialogue for our time uh, our second speaker is nathan bidder who is a professor of political theory at royal holloway university of london he is the author of genealogies of difference uh, published in 2002 and reflections on time and politics in 2008 and political theory of the layers 2012 uh, and uh, Professor Vida is currently working on an expected two-volume project on the role of the concept of sense in Deleuze's philosophy. Uh, Chun Mei Chuang is a professor in the Department of Sociology at Soochow University in Taipei, Taiwan. Her research interests include feminist theories, sociological theories, post-colonial discourse, science and technology studies, ecology and animal studies. She is the author of the post-colonial feminine situation, language. Translation and Desire, 2012; The Postcolonial Cyborg, a critical reading of Donna Haraway and Gary Spivak in 2016; and Molecular Translation in Keywords of Taiwan Theory; um, and Transspecies Diffraction in Beyond the Apocalypse: Disease, Globalization, and Proteins that is forthcoming. Uh, a huge welcome uh, to all of you, and especially to our speakers. And can't wait to begin. Over to Alex. Hey, thank you for a very kind um, introduction. And then I'm quite pleased to be a part of this uh, wonderful event. And also, I'm very honored with, uh, uh, you know, the these uh, the preeminent speakers, you know, the Nathan and the Chun Mei. All right. So, so to save the time, just I just get into actually my paper, and then. I'm gonna focus on the those you know the reception or uh, denial of a structuralism, and then I'm focusing focus focus on the you know relationship actually the the his uh, understanding of a structure and then his concept of the third. So uh, every philosopher has a buried secret underneath the surface of a speech or beyond moment of utterance. Deleuze himself mentioned that. A book of philosophy should be in part of a very practical, a particular species of a detective novel, in part a kind of science fiction. End quote. As a detective novel, the book is a rel- related to experiences, that is to say, actual experiments. As a science fiction, it involves the future of politics. In other words, the fabulation of the utopia. This statement proves that Deleuze's book of philosophy is a confrontation with Malarmé's notion of thought as throw throw of the dice. 
But you re revealed this riddle of Deleuze's uh, detective novel against influential poet to post-war philosophers. According to him, Deleuze presupposed that, quote, chance proceeds from the infinite, that infinite you have affirmed, end quote, while the maxim of Malachrome's subtractive ontology is that the uh, infinite proceeds from chance, the chance you have negated, end quote. For Malachrome, the poem is mystery whose clue the reader ought to seek, and then the reader must be a detective to search for the criminal of this sin. There's actually Badiou's understanding of Malachrome. On the contrary, the reader of Deleuze's detective novel would not be interested in the question concerning whose criminal is but how limitless chances forge the crime. In this story, the criminal is only one sense of a mystery, and the reader, as an explorer of a terra incognita, is the formation of an infinite, that is to say, life. This affirmative ambiguity of the immanence, the ontology of the univocal and the simultaneously equivocal being, is where the loose reformulation of a structuralism emerges. As for the loose relation to structuralism, the enigma is Louis Althusser, I would, I would say. Without considering this connection to Althusser, it is impossible to grasp Deleuze's ambiguous attitude to, uh, toward uh, structuralism. Althusser's influence shapes an under, undercurrent uh, through Deleuze's works, even actually the whole works, and is hovering around like a ghost. According to Balibar, uh, Etienne Baliba, Althusser say invited Deleuze and other philosophers to his lectures and seminars at the Ecole de Normale when he was a director of studies in philosophy. Further, Ted Stoltz uh, argues that Deleuze involved Althusser's later consideration of Lucretius, as you know, as philosophy encounter. And regarding this link, it will not be a surprise to see that Deleuze wrote how do we recognize structuralism at the end of 1967, an overdue account of a theoretical movement and asked Althusser to help him publish it. Of course, it wasn't a published, you know. Um, in this in intriguing uh, essay, Deleuze suggested the samples of structuralists such as Roman Jacobson, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, Jacques Lacan, Michel Foucault, Louis Althusser, Roland Bach, and the writers from Telkel. His classification proves that Deleuze recognized Althusser as structuralist, even though he put another name, a Marxist philosopher, alongside it. Deleuze already implied here the magic formula of monism, pluralism by defining structuralism as a migrant to each established domain, such as linguistic, sociology, psychoanalysis, epistemology, Marxism, etc., etc. From this perspective, structuralism turns out to be a theory of something, a thought always reserving irreducible remnants to language. Deleuze registered the standard view of structuralism as an equivalent method to the linguistic analysis and defined structure as combinatory formula, supporting formal elements, which by themselves have neither form nor signification, no representation, no content, no given empirical reality, no hypothetical functional model, no intelligibility behind appearances. For him, the structure should be grasped better by the nature of a certain atomic elements that claim to account for the formulation of formation of holes and the variation of their part. More interestingly, Deleuze identified this aspect structure with Althusser's concept of theory itself. As well known, Althusser described theory with a capital T as a general theory, the theory of a practice in general. A theory is, in Althusser's sense, elaboration of a theory of ex existing theoretical practices, which carves out knowledge aside from the ideological artifact of empirical practices and the quote, the materialist dialectic, which is none other than dialectical materialism, end quote. Althusser's concept theory aims at reformulating historical materialism and the Marxist understanding of a relationship between theory and practice. 
theory is expression of dialectic, the materialist, materialist dialectic, and there is no application of any theoretical formula to pre-existing context, uh, content. A theory as such, in this sense, is practice and experiment. Theory is nothing other than materialist science that can foresee, that means anticipate theoretical practice, which con continuously struggles against ideology. In, in, in Althusser's sense, theory is equivalent to the experimental exercise for the unpredictable event to come, not the analysis of present objectivity. The determinate effects of theoretical practice can only be created by experimentation and never arrive in the predictable sequences as in the cases of many revolution in history, when Deleuze with Guattari claimed that May 1968 did not take place, it seemed to bear Althusser's concept of theory in his mind. In the same fashion that Althusser emphasized the non-linear occurrence, occurrence of a historical event, such as the French Revolution and the Paris Commune and the Russian Revolution, Deleuze and Guattari argued that, quote, the event is itself splitting up from a breaking with causality. It is a bifurcation, a bifurcation a lowless deviation, an unstable condition that opens up new fields of possible, end quote. They insisted that possible does not pre-exist. Quote, it is created by the event, end quote. The cause of any uh, historical event is absent because it does not belong to the past, but arrives from the future. What brings out this absent cause is experimental exercise of theory. So Deleuze and Guattari elaborate, you know, actually what uh, Althusser argue in terms of what theory. Althusser developed this idea of theory in the period of Algerian war after this intervention in the political conception of historical knowledge. In 1955, Althusser wrote to Rikwa, who uh, regarded an objective history as historian's interpretation to defend the Marxist uh, approach to historical objectivity, Althusser you know, criticized Rikwa. In objectivity and subjectivity in history, Paul Rikwa pointed out that, quote, the responsibility of philosophical reflection would be to distinguish between the good and the bad objective of the history because the object of history is a human subject itself, end quote. Do you know why actually you know, the artist wrote to uh, Rikwa? Because of this subjectivism. From this perspective, Rikwa argued that history makes historian as, as much as the historian makes history, end quote. Althusser criticized this understanding of historical objectivity in that uh, Rikwa sought the formulation, a foundation of objectivity in the practice of historians solely, and they reduced that practice to an empty intention of objectivity. The focal point of Althusser's criticism of Rikwa lay in the way that Rikwa failed to distinguish between ideology and scientific theory and surrendered to historical relativism, even though he railed against the Raymond Aron sophism. For artists, it is not subjective interpretation that the historical objectivity reveals its causality, but, quote, general theories bearing on the content of history brings forth the fundamental scheme of understanding, end quote. In short, a historian always already relies on general theory when they interpret historical occasions. His point here is nothing other than the call upon theory. For this reason, Althusser presupposed that philosophy and politics are both the modality of the same, same problem. If there is no theory, philosophy and politics would not root in the reality properly and reproduce a given regimes only. The task of a, a genuine philosophy lies in the break with, in a break with its ideological genera and is a fundamental reversion as theory of a theoretical practice. This theoretical practice cannot be replaced by other practices, even though other practices organic, or, or organically articulate it. One must be stressed here is that Althusser rejected the common preconception of a relationship between theory and practice. Quote, an empiricist, an idealist error to say that scientific knowledges are the product of social practice in general, or the political and economic practice, end quote. 
Artists criticize a rigorous subjectivism whose uh, presumption rely on immediate experience because of its nostalgia for perception. If so, the source of this misunderstanding in a contemplative attitude, which awaits from science a sort of reproduction, reanimation, representation, or rather representification of real itself in its immediacy, end quote. I'll just say, uh, actually, you know, continued uh, denounced rigorous antinomy and then, you know, defended the uh, general theory of historical objectivity. Um, the, you know, the, what, what is at stake actually in the Althusser's argument is that Althusser revealed his standpoint again, both sides of the debate that we raised in French philosophy in 1950s. Consciousness or structure or in Althusser's term, subjectivism or formalism. His purpose was to refute, um, Althusser's purpose was to refute hermeneutic approach to history, which reduced its multiple objectivist into the philosophy of consciousness. Not surprisingly, Althusser's critique of rigor was the in inevitable consequence of his position opposed to Husserl's phenomenology. Endorsing Jean Gavaye and then uh, George Gankian, Althusser regarded Husserlian phenomenology as a hermeneutic, incapable of canceling the philosophy of consciousness. Above all, Gavaye, uh, influence on the uh, Gavai's influence on Althusser is essential because its effect is uh, detected even in Deleuze's challenge to structuralism. Althusser's confrontation with uh, Husserl was ascribed to his impetus to uh, attest Marxism as science against ideology, and Gavai's criti criticism of Husserl and the Vienna Circle uh, provided him with the theoretical foundation for Gavai. Um, um, the Husserl's phenomenology is inescapable from the philosophy of consciousness, even though it presupposes the objectivity of knowledge. This problem can be traced back to Kant's transcendental uh, analysis. You know, actually, the, in critique of pure reason, uh, Kant proved that the process of knowing as Im uh, immanent self illumination is the knowledge of act as such and necessarily needs to extract a priori from the objective contingency and experiences, which do not belong to consciousness. There must be something else or other to, to consciousness, whatever, you know, whenever you know anything, Kant defended this otherness as transcendental knowledge to know how the common understanding of object is possible. However, Kabai, uh, raised a question about uh, the Kant's assumption of a transcendence. And he argued that, quote, this pseudo empirical is only consciousness once again, denying itself in a game in which it is the first to be deceived, end quote. Here, Kant's theory of scientific knowledge reveals its formalistic aspect and seeking to reject its subordination to the absolute necessity of consciousness and the contingency of historical events the more compl completed, the further alienated from the objectivity outside of itself. The problem of formalism is its necessary requirement of object outside of its logical system. Its reference is always already the objectivity of the world, which necessarily correspond to the combinatory and must attest to a preference for certain factors. Formalism entails the theory of object, which must also the relativity of the authentic meanings and the multiplicity of the plotting beings. Betraying this dilemma internalized within the Kantian theory of scientific knowledge, Gabay uh, pointed out that, Gabay pointed out that, uh, quote, insofar as it is identifies itself with the system of all possible formalism, it absorbs rather than the canonizes the totality of formalizable demonstration and so the totality of science, end quote. All of these correspondences end up with the self-sufficient universal syntax, syntax, which is no longer dependent on, on any reality outside of its formal logic. So this is actually the meaning of formalism. Uh, therefore, Kant's attempt to bring forth the transcendental knowledge against psychologism fails to escape from the philosophy of consciousness and cannot solve the problem of psychologism that he rejected initially. Uh, from the you know Kavai to uh, Deleuze, you know, they criticize Kant this aspect. 
Uh, similarly, uh, Kawai clarified the difficulty of uh, in a Husserl phenomenological reduction. Phenomenology is an attempt to bring forth the synth synthesis between formalism and the philosophy of consciousness. The method of epoche is the a tactical gesture to produce a reduction of an irreducible experience of the act for the philosophy of consciousness and the formalist logic. However, Kawai regarded this reduction as another variation of philosophy of consciousness, which is still rests on the primacy of consciousness. The solution of Husserl's phenomenology for the philosophy of consciousness lies in its presupposition of a correlation between consciousness and the object, while as for formalism, it approves the de facto formal system that must be reduced to absolute consciousness. For Kawai, this uh, phenomenological solution is not fundamental enough in that it still presupposed creative subjectivity concerning the foundation of objectivity. The phenomenological method is in this sense an evasive answer to the contradiction of consciousness and logics. Uh, indeed, uh, Husserl's definition of transcendence uh, turns out nothing other than the ambiguous con conception to struggle with infinite plurality of conscious experiences. It is not difficult to know uh, why Spinoza is introduced here to sort out theoretical dilemma entailed with uh, Husserl's transcendentalism. Spinoza is an important reference for the deconstructing the phenomenological notion of consciousness. There is no such conscious, consciousness in general, but the multiplicity of a singular consciousness. None of anything causes another. Even any immanent origin of its, its idea does not function as any cause of consciousness. Therefore, any given consciousness cannot be separated from concepts or ideas. And then what is required for the theoretic science is not philosophy of consciousness, but the philosophy of the concept. So this is so important. Actually, the Deleuze also uh, rely on this and uh, develop on the French philosophy. It uh, focused on concept rather than the, you know, the consciousness. Not surprisingly, Kabai critique of Husserl and his conclusion about scientific theory was shared by Artise and Deleuze in their encounter with structuralism. In how, how do we recognize structuralism? Deleuze listed the seven criteria structuralism, the symbolic, local or positional, the differential and the singular, the differentiator, differentiation, serial, the empty square from the subject of practice. This definition of structuralism reappear in variations persistently through Deleuze's collaboration with Gattari. Therefore, the essay should not be regarded as marginal to Deleuze's other works from the late 1960s and should be considered as an important or central supplement to difference and repetition and the logic of sense. Deleuze pointed out that behind the real man and their real relation, behind uh, ideologies and their imaginary relations, Rui Altice discovered deeper domain as object science of philosophy, end quote. This deeper domain is the symbolic, which is uh, neither the imaginary nor the real, which the discovery and the recognition of third order, a third regime, end quote. The problem is uh, not actually the, this, uh, you know, the Deleuze's own you know, definition of uh, structure as a symbolic, is, uh, but rather his uh, concept, you know, his conceptualization of a third order, you know, a third regime. In other words, the discovery of the third order, the recognition of a third regime, serves as crucial concept for understanding Deleuze's reception of structuralism and its aftermath in his later works. Deleuze's notion of a third, you know, actually with capital third, must be grasped as not so much, not so much a descriptive term, but a theoretical concept in Kawai's sense. This concept of third will be important to understand, understand Deleuze's whole philosophical journey. From this idea, his concept of a third world will emerge you know, in cinema books. Unlike the normative appreciation of structuralism, Deleuze called the symbolic as third order, which is not defined by pre-existing reality to which it would refer and which it would designate or by the imaginary or conceptual comments uh, contents which it would implicate and which would uh, give it a signification and the code. So that means the third means actually must be a, something must be a new or something must be you know created, invented, you know. 
this uh, the the symbolic is the element of structure. In other words, a sound sense. This definition of a structure is important for understanding the approach to structuralism. More significantly, his concept of sense is not linguistic, but topological. You know, sense is about position, not a meaning. When Deleuze defines structure as topological space, he regards the structure space, structural space as space as a whole, but space as an intensive quantity. Contrary to extensive quantity, which is measured by data accumulation, the intensive quantity is not calculable like the growth or shrinking of Alice in Wonderland. You know, you can calculate, you know, the numbers of trees in wood, but you cannot actually calculate growth of trees, you know, in the wood. Indifference and repetition and the logic of sense, you know, Deleuze continue to rest on this concept topological space. This position space is a condition of linguistic production and his conceptualization of structure is an attempt to reformulate Kantian presupposition of the absolute condition of knowledge. For Kant, space and time a priori forms of the sensible intuition, that is to say, not empirical concept. Space is an a priori form of outer sense, while time is a priori form of inner, in, uh, in, inner sense. Intuition is different from the concept of category performed by the understanding and relate to how consciousness passively received data through sensibility. In this way, the sensation is the content of intuition, but its form already reside in subjectivity as to how, to, how the perceived data is classified. As well known, Kant stated that for in order for certain sensation to be related to something outside me, Thus, in order for me to represent them as outside and next to one another, thus not merely as different, but as in different places, the representation of space must be their ground, end quote. In this way, Kant did not say the space belongs to intuition per se, but rather the space is not the property of things independent of a priori intuition. This presupposition is a ground of Kant Kant's actual revolution, which turns epistemological inside out by suggesting that objective reality depends on the mind. To lose the concept of pure spatium, that means actually pure space, is an att attempt to rewrite this Kantian assumption of the mind reality frame. Therefore, his approach to structuralism should be understood as a theoretical project to come up with a new concept space and time against Kant's subjective idealism. Deleuze's purpose, as in the appropriation of structuralism as well, is clearly proclaimed in his critique of Kant. Regarding space and time, he points out that Kant defined all in intuitions as extensive quantities, and that this presupposition makes Kant's mistake. Deleuze argues that space and time are not presented as they are represented, and the presentation of a whole grounds of the possibility of parts. The whole is never possibly realized and experienced, but the condition of the possibility, the whole is presented as a virtual and then actualized only by, quote, the determinate, uh, the determinate uh, values of empirical intuition, end quote. Logical positivism, one of those that Kabai criticized as formalism, denies the virtuality of the whole and accepts only the public's verification of empirical data. Actually, we live in this, this kind of new, you know, positivistic world, like uh, algorithm and the technology and the lots of actually, you know, such a platform capitalism based on this new uh, positivism. And then this is the reason why we need to actually lose, you know, criticize, you know, what we experience at the moment. It's uh, assumption does not reject the metaphysical uh, doctrines, but regard them as nonsense. You know, of course, the whole could be calculable were calculated, but the calculation does not work out correctly. Always, you know, there is a kind of uh, asymmetrical, you know, relation between what we experience and what is represented. There is an irreducible asymmetrical conjuncture between the whole and the calculation. And this fundamental disparity brings forth condition of the world in delusion sense, the condition of a revolution, which testify the difference between extensive quantity and intensive quantity. Empirical intuit intuition is extensive, but its extens uh, extensity emerges from depths. Deleuze emphasized the extensity as a whole comes from the depths. Depths is intensity. The heterogeneous dimension of extensity, 
which concealed, uh, cancels itself in the homogenized third dimension of extensity. Dulles point is that extensity is topological and then there is fundamental relativity determination in measuring extensive quantity. This approximate calculability, calculability of extensity validates, uh, validates the depth is intensive spectrum whose positive characteristics are different distance and inequality. Therefore, extensive, ex extensity comes to exist between varying degrees of intensity grounded on the indetermination of groundlessness. So this is uh, actually the uh, way in which the, the rules, you know, the, uh, the reinterpret or some received, you know, the structuralism quite, uh, uh, you know, different way from the, you know, what we understand, you know, the structuralism. So actually I'm go to a uh, conclusion. So, uh, um, you know, the, another very important, you know, the discussion we can find out uh, in relation to Deleuze understanding of structuralism is uh, uh, critique of Robinson, is a Robinson Nate, is a Robinson story, all right? So, and then also the, he, uh, you know, described this one in his, uh, you know, the short uh, essay about uh, Desert Island. And, uh, you know, the, yesterday actually Helen also the, discussed this one that I, uh, the loose discussion of Robinson Crusoe is related to his reading of Levi Strauss. You know, he quoted the Levi Strauss emphasis upon difference between the universe, which is signified long before what is known as it is today, and the human signification, which always fails to represent the full scope of the universe. As has been discussed above, uh, Deleuze denoted this in, in inadequacy as Robinson's paradox. You know, the, the Robinson paradox is a paradox of uh, representation. Um, this paradox is a crisscross point where two heterogeneous series converge together, uh, or converge uh, towards their differentiator. Uh, Deleuze adopted this uh, mathematical model of differentia uh, differential calculus comprising multiple related meanings, such as an in, in infinitesimal a change in the value of a function for his reformulation of levi strauss structuralism. The premise of all revolution is ascribed to not technical progress, but the endless paradox, floating signi signifiers between a natural excess of signifying series and natural lack of signified series, which solicits a realignments of the economic and political totality in relation to the parts of technical progress. The gap between two series an empty square without occupants, an occupant without place, continuously betokens the permanent revolution. This difference cannot be canceled dialectically. In this sense, to lose concept structure as the paradox of the third, that is to say an empty square or dark precursor, uh, textually implies critical levistros. His uh, structuralism presupposes mechanical models and the uh, statistical models in, in explaining in explaining the global uh, symmetry of structures. For Levi Strauss, Robinson's desert island is symmetrical to the European society, even though he preserved in his pursuit of the symmetry in human activity, but emphasized the localized and the changeable nature of such a symmetrical distribution. Levi Strauss uses uh, statistical models for justifying a symmetrical localization and takes music as an example for the irre irreversible, irreversible element of the structure. On the contrary, Deleuze rejects statistic models and argues that, quote, the structure includes register of ideal events that is an entire history internal to it, end quote. The structure is not opposed to events, but a, a, a symmetrical, uh, a symmetrical, a symmetrical uh, condition of a permanent revolution. The ideal event in which every element belongs to no series or both series at once are the genesis of structure, not the symmetrical pairing of the universal human affairs. What then is in those, uh, what then is those human activity? Of course, it is the extension of the Robinson Nade over the globe. I mean, the bourgeois you know, colonialism or imperialism. The problem of Levi Strauss lies in his formalism. By, by which the presupposed difference between universality and the particularity is quickly negated. Against this formalistic determin determinism, Deleuze's challenge to structuralism concludes that, quote, there is no structure without the empty square, which makes everything function, end quote. For this reason, Deleuze had never been a structuralist, 
because he did not accept structuralism per se, and he was not a post-structuralist post because he had never abolished the concept of structure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, um, Alex, for that fascinating uh, paper and um, for those um, brilliant observations that uh, you know um, he has made on Kantian, on the denial of structuralism in in Deleuze and um, the movement away from Kantian Levi Strauss formalism and um, the, the the paradox of the third, as you mentioned, and for taking us through that journey through. Alam and Alcazar and Ricoeur and you know and and others and and to to flesh out this um, this history of of uh, the denial of of the structure itself. Thank you very much, um, and I hope that there will be many many uh, you know responses to to this paper. Um, and we can perhaps now move on um, and take the questions uh, at the end of this session. Um, so we now uh, kind of uh, move on to to Nathan and um, his uh, um, paper um, uh, and his paper. Nathan uh, Nathan's paper is on nihilism overcoming and the repetition phenomenon. Um, if Nathan is here, please. Yeah, I'm here. Over. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sandhya, for the introduction. Um, Thank you all for, for attending. Thanks to Manoj and the whole collective for inviting me, which is a, a really great honor. And um, well, I, I'll, I'll just begin. Th this is a paper, an extended version of a paper I gave a couple of months ago in, um, in a session for the Society for European Philosophy on the question of nihilism and, and new discussions in nihilism. I still don't know if I presented a new discussion of nihilism. And now there's an extended paper, which may or may not present a new discussion of nihilism. This paper explores the advent and the overcoming of nihilism as set out by Nietzsche and Deleuze, focusing on the idea that both the emergence and persistence of nihilism on the one hand and its overcoming on the other are related to the same repetition phenomenon within the structure of time. I contend that both nihilism's advent and overcoming involve what Deleuze refers to as the encounter with the event, and that their differences correspond to the difference between the repetitions of the second and third syntheses of time, where the former grounds the event in the transcendence of the pure past, and the latter, concerning only the future, ungrounds time in order to guarantee the possibility of the new. The two syntheses are connected by the way the grounding of time involves illusions engendered by time's structural ungrounding. Deleuze, referring to the death of God, notes that Nietzsche does not believe in great events, but rather in a silent plurality of senses of each event. We can add that this is a plurality of temporal senses that express an out of sync character of time and of the event. This temporal plurality is certainly found in Nietzsche's various accounts of the nihilistic condition. The God who was born from a situation where faith was needed because will was lacking has died. And now the highest values devalue themselves. They don't necessarily have a value of zero, though their foundation that had given them a higher status is found to be valueless. It has a value of nil. In any case, the devaluation of these values as higher values leaves them no more valuable than anything else, including their antonyms. Truth is now no better than falsity, good no better than evil. Indeed, truth and goodness might not even be as useful as their counterparts though we all know that both they and their counterparts prove to be useful and are needed. Whatever our contemporary values may be, however, they are always already obsolete. They express, quote, uh, conditions of preservation and growth that belong to times long gone by, that's from the will to power, which means that they can only ever be partially compatible with our present conditions of life. In this regard, the advent of nihilism reveals the always already existing inadequacy of our values. Nonetheless, this revelation does not make these values disappear. The madman who leaves the marketplace where the laughter of the onlookers had brought about his declaration that they and he had together murdered God, proclaims that his time has not come yet 
and that the event has happened, yet the perpetrators still do not know about it. How could they not but carry on with these same values as if nothing had happened? Nietzsche would in no way be surprised that today a majority of people, and in the case of some countries, a vast majority, still say they believe in God, and that many, even if a declining number in many places, still attend places of worship. Scientists, of course, still piously believe in the value of truth, even if this value is not scientifically demonstrable. And we still align goodness with purity and evil with corruption. But the precarious nature of our values, under the conditions that not of nihilism, leads us, consciously or not, to cling to our traditional associations and values more stringently and even violently. The growth of the vicious and reactionary nationalism that Nietzsche decried is simply one of the most overt and political examples of this, and the consequences are well known. Now, while the combination of devaluation and continuation of our values is an important and I think often underappreciated aspect of nihilism. As I say, I want to focus instead today on how nihilism is related to the repetition phenomenon. When Nietzsche presents the eternal return as, quote, the most scientific of all possible hypotheses, unquote, he holds that in it, existence is, quote, as it is without meaning or aim, yet recurring inevitably without finale and nothingness, unquote. The eternal return, whose affirmation is supposed to be the key to overcoming nihilism, is also, at least in some form, the most nihilistic thought. The question is what, if any difference, there might be between this scientific and nihilistic thought of an endless recurrence of the same and the eternal return that Nietzsche declares to be, quote, the highest form of affirmation that is all attainable, unquote. Now, only a fool or a Heideggerian would interpret Nietzsche's doctrine as requiring some sort of return of the same. Indeed, after his first formulation of the doctrine written in August 1881, after his epiphany 6,000 feet beyond man and time, Nietzsche writes of an eternal return of the same in only a handful of places, and the rest of the time Heidegger just implies that the clause is there. Deleuze is right to argue that the eternal return as a, doc is, as a doctrine able to overcome nihilism must involve a return of difference, where any sameness is a sameness of the different insofar as it differs. We must inquire into what exactly this difference could be. Now, it is said that there are things that are impossible to explain to a person who hasn't been divorced at least once. I won't tell you who says that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try because whether it's the breakdown of a relationship, the death of a loved one, a painfully public humiliation, involvement in a car crash, being trapped in a war zone, um, or pretty much any other happening whose unfolding might take place gradually over time or suddenly in a moment, or maybe like bankruptcies of all sorts in both ways at once, and which might further be traumatic or even quite banal. You don't need Freud to know how the event can initiate a repetition that operates beyond any reference to pleasure or the pleasure principle. We find ourselves compelled to replay in memory and even in action, the events in the context that led to them. Freud tells us that by way of this repetition, one comes to master the trauma. This he says is what the soldiers of the great war are doing by reliving their terrors during sleep. But there does not seem to be anything in the repetition as such that necessitates such mastery as its result. Indeed, experience shows us very much the opposite. We continually tell and retell the story of the event to ourselves, seeking to identify the tipping points or points of no return. When did my partner change? When did I change? Did either of us change? Did things fall apart because we changed or because we didn't? We repeat the story, searching for the answers that no version of the story ends up able to provide. And each version we tell ourselves will be a repetition with a difference. None of them will ever be exactly the same, just as no two grains of sand or drops of rain are the same. But these differences will not get us beyond the event to create or affirm something new. I would think that everyone here has, at one time or another, experienced the rut of being in such repetitions with their meaningless differences. And this condition strikes me as being as much an experience of nihilism as anything else. Is it any wonder that Deleuze holds that difference without concept, the indifferent differences that distinguish otherwise identical repetitions without affecting their fundamental or essential identity, 
is not the essence of repetition. Not every difference is able to grant to repetition the superior positive principle it demands. So we have an event, a repetition phenomenon, and a problem of finding the right sort of difference. The event occurs at an identifiable time and place, and this alone is enough to ensure it is different from all others. But it also is a temporality and a difference of its own that constitutes its singularity. Leotard in Heidegger and the Jews offers a formulation of this temporality in terms of two moments or dimensions of the event itself. There is first a shock without effect, a blow of such force that it exceeds the capacity of the psychic system to register it, and so it can actually go unnoticed by the subject impacted by it. If you are a fight fan, as I have sometimes been, you may be familiar with the delayed knockout phenomenon in which a fighter hit with a knockout blow continues to fight, sometimes for several seconds, as though his brain needed time to figure out that now is the time to shut down and fall over unconscious. And then eventually it goes on to do just that. Leotard writes that this first blow is, quote, like a whistle that is inaudible to humans but not to dogs, or like infrared or ultraviolet light, and that it is, quote, a silence that does not make itself heard as silence. But then secondly, there is an effect without a shock. In an everyday situation that has nothing remarkable about it, a situation of banal repetition, I suddenly experience a shudder of the sort that gets likened to one, someone walking over one's grave. Emma in the store sees the shopkeepers laughing and this triggers something in her that leaves her unable to walk into a store alone anymore. But there's nothing within the experienced situation to explain this. The error, Leotard says, is to do exactly what Freud does with Emma, which is to connect the second moment, the effect without shock, back to some earlier event that is thought to have gone unregistered at the time and whose effect is therefore delayed. The two events moments, the events two moments, sorry, shock without effect and effect without shock are thereby embedded into a narrative unfolding in extended chronological time, turning them into something comprehensible and representable. But what defines the event, Leotard insists, is precisely that these two moments are immediately and paradoxically juxtaposed in a way that defies the possibility of any narrative making sense of them. We must understand this juxtaposition, he says, is the condition of, quote, a soul struck without a striking blow. Now, to explain this further, I will refer to a movie that I have never seen, but towards which I feel a certain kinship. And I should add that I probably can never see the film for fear that it won't match my understanding of it, and so will destroy the kinship feeling. It's a French film entitled Cinq fois deux, five times two. It tells the story of a couple, the deux, by way of five main scenes, the sank, presented in reverse chronological order. So it begins with their divorce. That's the kinship feeling. And it ends with the scene of their getting together. And what becomes apparent at the end of the film, or so I'm told, is that everything in the two characters that ultimately led to their divorce was already present at the start, so that the fundamental incompatibility between them, which might seem to manifest itself only later, was always already there. And this suggests, to me at least, that their entire relationship must have been marked by a paradox in which they were together at the same time that they were not, that they were in love at the same time that they were indifferent to each other, that they were married at the same time that they were, for all intents and purposes, already broken up. Did the marriage end because one partner changed? Didn't end because he or she didn't change? I can tell you from personal experience, that is, a scientific study of my own with a sample size of one. That is when you realize that both of these are true, in my case, she changed and didn't change, that your head divides by zero and gets an error. And that's when the traumatic character of the event arrives. That's the moment in chronological time when you begin to continually replay and replay the story of your relationship and its breakdown in your head, vainly hoping that some version of the story can make sense of what happened. This is the traumatic neurosis that Freud holds can be really productive and therapeutic, but no narrative structure can accommodate the paradox that amounts to there having been at least two versions of your partner and of yourself in the relationship. 
each one a double rather than a copy of the other. And it's not simply two partners, but two realities. The partner who changes and the one who doesn't are incompossibles, belonging, as Deleuze says, drawing on Leibniz, to seemingly different worlds. One world where you were in a loving relationship and one where you never quite were. The trauma comes about with the realization that these two realities are somehow present and part of the same world. Now, Nietzsche describes the advent of nihilism, literally Europe's divorce from the Judeo-Christian God in precisely these terms. The point, if there is one, when the relationship breaks down irrevocably is never the point where the partners go their separate ways. Indeed, if there is such a moment, the most likely aftermath of it is that the partners continue to struggle on as though nothing had happened because no one is yet re ready to notice the knockout blow, blow has been struck. And so God is dead when a madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours and entered the marketplace inquiring about his whereabouts is laughed at by those who do not even believe in God in the first place. After that moment in chronological time, truth can continue to shine, but it does so in a darker world because, quote, the insane could be accepted formally as its, that is truth's mouthpiece, which makes us shudder and laugh. That's Nietzsche and the gay science. God, too, can continue to shine in this darker world. Again, plenty of people still believe in God, even if those laughing in the marketplace do not. But God is dead at this point. Christianity, thanks to its own morality and will to truth, has, quote, has jumped the shark. And so its TV series is essentially dead, if you know what that phrase, jump the shark, means. Its TV series is essentially dead, even if its popularity continues for many more seasons. Turns out, though, that God had already died in the pilot episode, the idea of him from the start being so absurd that the gods died laughing upon hearing it. Yet he still lives on as a shadow in a cave, a shadow, Nietzsche says, that must still be vanquished. God is alive and dead at once. We are moving on without him, except that we're not. And so there are two incompossible and undecidable stories to be told. This duality emerges off an event involving a madman in a marketplace. But is this event a shock without effect or an effect without a shock? It is necessarily and paradoxically both. Excuse me. Now with nihilism's emergence, we become like the coyote chasing the roadrunner and running off the cliff. I realize that these are a lot of American television and movie references, well, a French movie reference too but hopefully you all know about the coyote and the roadrunner. There's no ground beneath us, no support, but we have not yet fallen because we have not yet looked down. At best, we have a suspicion forming as we reach our paws like the coyote does below the cloud of dust to feel around beneath us, unless we're still running as the coyote sometimes does when falling through an extended series of catastrophes. But we were never on any firm ground to begin with. We are always running as if on a cloud of dust through catastrophes. Nihilism has been the condition of all our culture and history. Hence, nihilistic and negative values, Deleuze says, have always been the only known and knowable values for us. And it is not simply that we have been running without any ground underneath. The split condition of the event, holding together a paradox that cannot be ironed out by any narrative seeking to encompass it, is likewise our condition. Freud and Lacan both make this point. The traumatic experience evokes a sense of an earlier wholeness that is now broken and lost, but we were never whole in the first place. And this was just a post hoc projection. Whatever the event did to us, it did it to a being that was already paradoxically divided within itself, struck without a striking blow, temporarily fractured in such a way that no story could unite its disparate moments. The event's unrepresentable temporality and plurality are univocal with our own. Deleuze and the logic of sense refers to this imminent split as a constitutive silent crack. A couple with all the looks, charm, riches, and most importantly, superficiality needed to be happy, glide along until an event derails and shatters them. This catastrophic event is a noisy accident but it would, be not, it would not be sufficient to shatter us in the way it does, unless it had dug down and connected to a silent crack of a totally different nature, imperceptible, incorporeal, impassive, 
neither inside nor outside us, but relating to the temporality that ensures we are never self-identical wholes. Deleuze asks in the logic of sense how we can come to affirm these events in the silent crack to which they connect. Either ethics makes no sense at all, he writes, or this is what it means and it has nothing else to say, not to be unworthy of what happens to us. How can we emulate Joe Bousquet, the soldier paralyzed in the Great War, who used his catastrophic injury to become, uh, who, who used his catastrophic injury as the starting point for a body of work, Deleuze writes, which is in its entirety a mediation on the wound, the event, and language, culminating in Bousquet's declaration that, quote, my wound existed before me, I was born to embody it. The events that happen to us are shitty. There are, of course, joyful events, but bear with me. And their shittiness does not disappear when they are affirmed. They remain shitty. But there is nevertheless a volitional intuition and transmutation that can occur because the event has no necessary meaning or sense in relation to the subject who experiences it, so that it can be released from any particular sense it has by, way of, by the way the subject becomes other. So here I'd like to talk briefly about events and sense in the logic of sense. Events Deleuze maintains are the incorporeal effects of corporeal bodies and their interactions. They constitute a domain of sense insofar as they can free themselves from these bodies and express pure becomings that are indifferent to the corporeal actions and passions from which they emerge. A scalpel penetrates a body, but this reality's meaningfulness comes not from the physical interaction of the metal and flesh, but insofar as this singular happening relating to other singular happenings gives rise to an impersonal, pre-individual, and ideational event of cutting in proximity to which the scalpel and body are placed. It is in proximity to a pure event of greening that a tree can be said to be or become more or less green, in proximity to an event of sinning that Adam is judged to sin or not sin, in proximity to an event of thinking that one can declare, I think. In each case, a bivalence prevails in the sense of these pure events. They express a becoming in two directions at once. But the indifference and impassivity of these events also means that the, their relations to one another are not causal, but only quasi-causality. This quasi-causality amounts to, quote, an unreal and ghostly causality, unquote, which is uh, as much as to say it is a false causality. This quasi-causality is not causal at all. The relations of events are external relations, and so there's no necessary order to the series that can be formed from them. Hence, the Stoics, as Deleuze says, were able to affirm destiny at the level of corporeal causes while denying necessity at the level of incorporeal effects. It is nevertheless by way, the way events form disparate series, each one being a conjugation of effects, and resonating with other series through a paradoxical element, which is nothing other than the silent crack itself, that the surface of events is formed. Now, the surface of, event, the surface of sense results from the effectuation of pure events. I, I know that Charlie Stivali is listening and he was part of this translation, so apologies in advance. I hope you take it good, in, good fit and, uh, in good form. The English translation of the logic of sense almost always renders the French effectuation as actualization, unhelpfully suggesting, sorry, Charlie, that sense involves the actualization of a virtual. The Deleuzean sense is above all not virtual because its events are not virtual. They are rather intensive. Hence the rules governing the static genesis, genesis of sense are Leibnizian and the effectuation of events described therein involves their individuation and incarnation. The communication of ideational verb events affects static, ontological, and logical genesis. The first concerns individuals and persons from this imperson uh, formed from this uh, impersonal pre-individual field. Individuals in gender worlds defined by vice diction and convergence, the individual being a monad enveloping and expressing the totality of the world, but expressing clearly and distinctly only a local region of it. Persons connect incompossible worlds. Person is, quote, objectively indeterminate, a vagabond or nomad, 
who, quote, holds good for many of these worlds or in the last analysis for all worlds, despite their divergences and the individuals which inhabit them, unquote. Individuals and persons bear absolutely singular predicates. The tree is this color, it is this green. And in that sense, there is nothing more general about having color than being green. Disparate atoms reside in a multiplicity of gardens, but each is always this singular garden. Singular predicates nonetheless provide the logical possibilities for propositions that using individuals and persons of material instances resolve the problematic surface structure of events bringing them to bear upon objects and states of affairs in a second genesis, in the second genesis, the logical genesis. In contrast, counter-effectuation releases the event from the individuated senses that its effectuation entails, returning it to an impassiveness where it communicates with all other vice-dicting and incompossible events and realities. It affirms difference and divergence, and for Deleuze, this is an ethical affirmation. Bousquet's poetic mediation on his catastrophic wound concerns the possibility of amor fati, a love of fate without resentment, which does not transform the injury into something cheerful, nor does it express resignation in the face of the event, but instead releases the self from the resentment and ill will that comes from a moral condemnation of the world that allows such events to happen to us. This is why counter-effectuation is less about changing the event itself, even while it releases it from a particular sense, than it is about transforming the self. Through affirmation, the affirmation that makes you worthy of the event, you become other. And in this way, you can move on from the event. But in a way, that means it's not even you who's moving on, precisely because in becoming, you are not even you anymore. So it is someone else who, who moves on. Now, how we become in this way for Deleuze is again a matter of repetition. We need to look again at the incompossibilities whose belonging to the same world precludes there being any narrative to make sense of the event. Deleuze here is fo both follows and breaks with Leibniz. For Leibniz, one atom sins in this world and another atom does not sin in another world. These two atoms, sinner and non-sinner, are indiscernible since their essence, Leibniz argues, is the same but they're completely different since they entail incommensurable realities. In this way, the two atoms repeat each other without either, being, uh, either one being an original that the other copies well or badly. That's why they're not copies, they're doubles. But by insisting that incompossibles belong to the same reality, Deleuze profoundly shifts the entire sense of Leibniz's proposition. For we now confront a world which is in fact our world, where Adam sinning or not sinning remains is rendered undecidable, or where Adam both sins and does not sin because it depends on your point of view. This is a world of Nietzschean perspectivism where there are no facts, but only interpretations struggling for supremacy with one another. And this is condition obtained because there are no longer any moral absolutes or transcendent values. We have entered the twilight of the idols, the death of God, the advent of nihilism. But it is therefore a world where the passage of people, time, and events is entirely ungrounded. No past conditions and determines the present since the past is a multiplicity of incompossibles and undecidables that cannot be put in any simple order of cause and effect. The future in turn can never impose a telos or necessary progression on what precedes it. And the present itself remains the time of an event that is both a shock without effect and an effect without shock two temporally disparate moments that somehow belong together. The repetition entailed by this play of incompossibles is therefore one that serves not so much to produce the new, but to guarantee the possibility of such production. So the internal return is not what makes everything new, it's what guarantees the future is open and therefore the new can, can, can emerge. Um, we're reaching the end, by the way. A final question remains of what differentiates the nihilistic and the affirming repetitions, each of which seemingly follows from the same paradoxical structure of the event. Now, a fully elaborated answer would require another paper that I lack the chronological time to present here, but I would like to close the paper by suggesting one. And here I draw on something Deleuze says in Difference and Repetition about the differences between the second and third syntheses of time. The second synthesis 
which installs difference within repetition as a variation. And the third synthesis, which makes repetition in the eternal return the for itself of difference in itself, or the absolute and unconditioned repetition of different. The second synthesis involves a series, involves series of real and virtual objects that circular, circulate around a special virtual object, the phallus, that has no identity itself and exists only by hiding or disguising itself. Well, the third synthesis involves a differentiator as an object equals X, again with no identity, that circulates through and ramifies heterogeneous series of differences by linking them through their difference. Deleuze insists that despite their structural proximity, the virtual object of the second synthesis and the differentiator of the third synthesis cannot be brought together, that the two syntheses cannot, quote, be combined or made to alternate within the same synthesis, unquote. And the reason he gives for this is essentially that the second synthesis finds its conditions in certain perspectival illusions engendered by the third is because of the way the differentiator sustains a simulacrum of differences that it gives rise to the appearance or simulation of an identity that is, quote, found to be necessarily projected or rather retrojected onto the originary difference, a resemblance interiorized within the divergent series, unquote. That's from difference and repetition. Conversely, what tends to happen in the second synthesis is that the phallus is virtual object functioning as a primordial event of prohibition, assumes, quote, the status of a former present, albeit mythical, unquote, and thereby reconstitutes, quote, the illusion it was supposed to denounce, resuscitating the illusion of an original and a derived of an identity in the origin and a resemblance in the derived, unquote. In other words, the second synthesis inevitably leads us back to transcendence by presenting itself as the unrepresentable ground of representation built on a transcendental illusion of identity created by the third synthesis. Leotard says something similar when he discusses how the traumatic event gets formulated as a never to be spoken foundation for the community along the lines of Freud's primal patricide or the Jewish conception of a temperamental and vindictive God who cannot be mentioned by name. Where the event becomes a kind of originary wound, prohibition or threat, it works to sustain a subject albeit a broken subject that holds itself together through its own raison de mont, a subject that nihilistically repeats the story of the shitty events that have happened to it. But insofar as the illusion of its originary character can be overcome so that the crack of the event is not, the start, is not a starting point, but nothing other than the disparateness that characterizes our becoming, we can move beyond our subjectivity and its negative relation to the event and therefore uh, thereby affirm both it and us. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Nathan, for that, uh, for that paper. I mean, I, I'm leaving us with, with, with uh, you know, such a profound statement. <laughs> um, and of course, at the end, uh, somehow you managed to come back to a certain kind of affirmation. I don't know whether it's a fleet of hand or, <laughs> or further provocation um, and, and what, which category it would fit into, shock without effect or effect without shock. Uh, but these, are, these, are, uh, these give us uh, excellent directions uh, to think about. And of course, it relates back to Alex's um, you know, uh, comments and observations on, on the third regime of sense as well and, and what he said about the symbolic um, and, and uh, you know, and, and representation, and and of course um, the incom the incommensurability of of both. Um, thank you very much, Nathan, and um, looking forward to to all the responses to your paper. Um, and we'll quickly move on. Uh, I think we 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 have some time, so we will try and stick to it. Um, uh, our third um, scenery. Um, uh, panelist is, is Chun Mei Chuang, um, whose paper is um, titled Reconfigure the Rhizome, Microbial Sensibility and Virocellular Politics. Okay, thank you. 
So I, I will share my screen. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yeah, right, okay. Um, thank you for having me here for this wonderful event. So, um, we should. Okay, okay th this is uh, the basic structure of my paper. And because I am going to talk a lot of uh, um, biology, so bear with me. <laughs> Okay, not much philosophy itself, but more biology. So um, there are three. So th this is the project of uh, virus the politics. So um, there are three main concepts of my paper, rhizome, microbial sensibility, and uh, virus cell. And as we know, um, the Lutz and uh, Gautry's, Gautry's uh, notion of rhizome is partly based on um, the research about viral capacity to transfer genes across species. And, and now we know more about uh, what viruses can do. So my key was viral capacity and its expansion will be uh, the focus of this paper. So I assume that um, for rhizome, um, with which I assume that we all know, we are more or less familiar. So I only want to mention two points. First, rhizome is not against the tree or root structure. Uh, for Deleuze and Gautry, there is no ontological dualism between here and there, no axiological uh, dualism between bad and good. And they are only becomings. So a becoming is a moment or a flight from overcoding, a breaking free from some fixation or, or bonding point. So of course, uh, Deleuze and Gautry, uh, they say in a book, in a, a solemn prayer that we are tired of tree. But we are tired of tree only because and when it is overcoded and it is overcoding and uh, prone to superlinearity. Uh, super so forming rhizome is to escape from the tendency of overcoding and release or create rise of fright. And memory and anti-memories are not antithesis just like the molecular and mona are not opposite. Instead, we have entered, uh, I would say, a, a multi scalar measurement regime, which has reconfigured our understanding of boundaries and uh, territorialization to a certain extent that we need to reconsider what uh, boundaries, a thing, or a force, or whatever it is. So making or becoming molecular rhizomes with one another has been a powerful uh, potential in politics and in theory in our times, while the problematics of boundaries remains challenging and demanding our attention. So, so I'm going to talk about this uh, interface politics. Um, so I argued in this paper that the Russian rhizome or rhizomatics would benefit from the cautious supplement of interface politics at the cellular level. So the difference, the difference between the molecular and the cellular is not absolute, but theoretically about the boundaries of existence that are always open to me. Renegotiation. The history of uh, cell biology is famously based on the miniaturization of a modern technology, and this process continues. 
today um, through quantum physics and uh, molecular biology and to the sophisticated regimes of uh, genomics of the centuries. So all, all this happened at the interface between the observer and uh, the observed, um, whose compositions already have more interfaces within and without and in between. The microscopic device is not only an instrument or a, a visualizing tool, but a part of both the observer and the observed. It is an interface that is both to consider the same and different. So it is almost, I say almost because sometimes it does, um, not doesn't matter that who the subject or the object is, but what really matters is the distribution of agency and uh, sensibilities among various forces and becomings, as well as the contextualized, contextually, uh, contextually specific measurement, understanding, uh, reconfiguring and practices. So the sensibility of things, including us, is a crucial aspect of uh, any scientific uh, measurement and therefore vital to our understanding of the world. We recognize that the emergent phenomena of uh, planetary life bears the faculties of uh, technology and cognition as displayed in countless cellular signaling and communication networks in biological organization or organisms. So as long as living cells evolved, the internal relationship between life and technology already existed. And the process of uh, inter intelligent predatory evolution was initiated. So Lee Margulis's notion of uh, microbial might, so this is the quote that, uh, in the slide, uh, the quote from Lee Margulis, who is the hero of uh, new materialism, <laughs> I would say. Um, he says in another quote, brains, brains appear later, but consciousness, awareness of surrounding environment starts with the beginning of life itself. So sensation, sensibility, cognition, consciousness, um, knowledge and technology are, I would say a fruit, a fruit continuity in living matter. So in symbiogenesis, resulting in new forms of life or new species, one witnesses the evolution of uh, multi-layered assemblages of uh, Techno technological configuration. So reorganization of life requires redistribution of various life strategies and technologies. Moreover, in this process, every component that fused in symbiogenesis were already conscious entities. So this is from Lee Margulis. Um, Another quote, by studying what strikes now, we can reconstruct the past directly from living organisms, even microbial might. That is uh, the quote here. So notably, modern um, microbiologists' reconstruction of the past has already taken a leap from the more traditional uh, tree image or uh, of a recent image of uh, genealogy. It is a leap to entanglement, molecular entanglement, if, if not a leap to phase made possible by microscopic measurement regime. And in the times of a molecular entanglement, we are not merely subject or object, but always already part of the things that we measure and participate 
with all the other items in producing most things, including concept. Um, so politics of becoming and politics of boundaries are not opposite, or the, the, the politics of becoming does not cancel politics of boundaries. Um, to the contrary, there is a, a certain complementarity between these two modes of politics, especially in our world of a molecular entanglement. So I want to talk about cells and viruses um, as uh, their relationships, or indeed all uh, trans species or interspecies or cross species relationship as working or functioning in the field of uh, called evolving forces. Cells, uh, at least according to the standard biology textbook, cells are the basic unit of life. The membranes define the boundaries of all cellular lives, cellular organism. And uh, they are also um, essential materials for the internal structure of uh, eukaryotic cells. So in the time of COVID-19 pandemic and the global um, antibiotic resistant crisis, we face constant public health challenges and that, that's all about uh, the mechanism of cells in the last instance. Strategies and pathways are the key words both in life and in politics. So here uh, in the slide, I, I mentioned uh, Nietzschean philosophy uh, written by Deleuze because uh, when we talk about um, antibiotic resistance or uh, our immune responses, uh, we tend to, to uh, describe some forces as active and the other forces as reactive, but According to Nietzsche and the Deleuze, all forces are active. There are no such thing as uh, reactive forces. So this is the, the important notion of active science because that is the way to uh, really understand uh, the, the image or the uh, positioning of viruses how we understand viruses, because um, the identity of viruses um, at first, when we discover viruses, but without really know what it looks like, um, we know it's infectious. So there is this agency of infections. So, the scientists tend to think this is some kind of like bacteria they are alive. But then when, when scientists look closer and they realize that because uh, due to the uh, invention of electron microscope in 1930s, um, we, are able to, we are able to visualize viruses. We enter the era of sub uh, wavelengths technology, which allows us to see um, in a certain way viruses. And viruses are not defined as alive because they don't have the cellular machinery of self-reproduction, uh, development, and metabolism. But interestingly is, Interestingly, when we look even closer, like now, or uh, when we enter the 21st century, the argument that viruses are alive after all, or live viruses can be viewed as uh, another kind of life, as um, the concept of virus cells argued, began to gain its uh, Memorton. Yeah, so, and this Z genome in my slide is about 
uh, because now biologists uh, generally agree that viruses are the most uh, abundant biological entities on Earth. And they are so, not, not so numerous, but also very diverse that some of viruses even develop their unique gene coding system, which is called G genome, because they use this um, another special chemical base to repress one of the, uh, the four main nuclear bases we are familiar with, like ATCG. So this is just an example of how uh, diverse and uh, special that viruses are. So I should just skip to this concept of virus cell. So this, this is, uh, okay, I'll, this one. Viral cell is uh, the concept proposed by French uh, microbiologist Patrick Fortels. So this schematic representation of a virus cell is uh, deceptively simple because of course it's not so simple, it's very complicated. So this is a T4 virus cell. T4 is a bacteriophage. That bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. So T4 is a bacteri bacteriophage that infects Escherichia uh, coli. That is a very common bacteria that in human, you can find in human guts and, and in water in soil. So when, so uh, I should first mention uh, the definition of a virus, because now we have more understanding of viruses, but the question still remains that what is a virus? And one might say that we already know that. But actually, think again, the scientists do not have the same answer because you can define a virus from different aspects. Um, the main two, two aspects, um, one is um, viruses is, can be defined by its capacity of infecting cells. In that definition, uh, viruses are equal to virions. Virions is the viral particles. And this is the usual definition. And Fortel has this another definition, alternative definition that based on what a virus does when it enters is host cell. And he argued that the real virus only begins when it enters a cell, its host cell. And after that, the cell will be completely reprogrammed or remodeled or rewritten into something else that he calls a virus cell. So this uh, representation, as you can see, so let me take a look at this. Um, that is the bacterial fish T4 with a head and tail, and a tail, uh, this didn't show the, the tail fibers. So the interesting about this is uh, if you know in the textbooks, uh, there is this famous classical description of virus that a virus um, transform the cell into a viral factory. And for tells translate translates this sentence into the virus 
uh, transform the cell into a virion battery. And because a virus is defined by the capacity of uh, producing more virions, so in this sense, the sentence can be also translated as a virus transforms the, the virus transforms the cells into a virus. So the so this is about uh, viral, I will I will call this uh, this discussion, all this, this discussion about definition of virus viruses, a discussion of viral identity politics. I mean, what is a virus? And uh, is the a, a viral an infected cell still the host organism cells, or it is transformed into another organism, another life form? Okay, so as you can see, that this idea is very controversial, and it causes many objections. And I found this fascinating because. It is all about uh, the interface politics, the boundaries, and the reorganization of uh, matters and information. So, uh, Dr. Chung, um, uh, yeah. I'm sorry to, to uh, interrupt. Um, uh, we might time, be running out of time. Yes. Time is up. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'll get to the final point. Okay. So this viral cellular politics. Um, I would really talk about this. So I argue that uh, but viral cellular politics highlights the interface of the viruses and their host cells and uh, um, so it is it is similar to the more popular semiotic biopolitics but highlights that we uh, look into the re negotiation of boundaries or, or, or the dry zone as uh, forming heterogeneous elements together, but without overlooking the dark side of our planetary life. Okay, I said I will stop here. So if, if we have more time to discussion, then I will um, talk more. Okay, thank you. I'm, I, I deeply apologize for cutting that no, excellent no. presentation short. Um, I, I would have loved to, uh, yeah, we would have loved to uh, continue uh, hearing your thoughts and, and especially, I mean, on the formulation of the viral cellular, which is exactly, I mean, what we are plagued by uh, in, in the contemporary. Um, I, I think we can now um, open up the session uh, for questions. <clears throat> um, I think Charles. I have, um, I have a question for yes. Nathan. Yes. Sir. Um, don't don't feel bad. Um, you know the Monty Python routine. Um, where they say you never expect the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah. Um, so I, one never expects to be called out uh, in the middle of a talk. So, so consequently, uh, and I also it's only over it. one word. <laughs> yes, I know, and and I'm not even I'm not even interested that much. But um, I got up at 3 a.m. this morning to be able to be here. So by the time I listened to your paper, I was sort of in a fugue state. Um, but could you just go back over um, that because it's actually the 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 word itself is actually relevant in mm -hmm. the sense that um, it's not a word that goes away in Deleuze. Yeah. Um, we're busily translating um, over in uh, uh, the Deleuze seminars, and so you know if there's oh, okay. 
we can tweak uh, it, it, everything is easily tweakable. Okay. Um, oh, oh, okay. So, so it's just, um, I mean, and part of it's just, I, I'm sure the timing of the translations, because Logico Sense is translated in 1990, so before, um, before Paul's translation of Difference and Repetition. But um, obviously, Difference and Repetition speaks of actualization using the French verb actualization. And um, Logic of Sense refers to effectuation, which, which, as far as I can tell, is not used in a technical sense in any of Deleuze's earlier writings. But I think it, it quite clearly takes on a, a consistent technical sense in the logic of sense. And, and so if you, you know, in the translation, it's usually translated as, as actualization, except when it appears next to actualization, when Deleuze speaks about both, which is very rare. But, but, and then it's, if, then it's translated as realization. Um, but if it's read, I think, in light of the distinctions in difference or repetition between the virtual and actual on one side and the intensive, which individuates on the other, I think it, it's easy to see that effectuation is referring to individuation. It, it, it's referring to the, to the intensive. And so that's why, as I made the point in, um, when you look at the static ontological genesis, they're all about the individuation of the event, right? That's where Simon Dong comes back in and so forth. So I, I think I think the consequence of this, as I see it, but I've seen it, I've seen it in, in texts in, in people who are clearly are, are using the originals too, is that the logic of sense, sense is read as something virtual, right? It's a virtual that actualizes itself. And, and that's simply just not to me what the text is saying. Sense is something intensive, which unfolds itself by way of effectuation. Now, of course, you know, effectuation, you know, you know it, it can be translated as realization, sometimes as, as, as actualization, you know, in an everyday sense, it's perfectly fine. Um, and and, and as, um, as, uh, as accomplishment. And, and so, I mean, I think, I think one of the ways you can kind of see it is, you know, the virtual has to be actualized, but as actualization is, has to be accomplished. Right. I mean, like that's in a sense what the differentiation of differentiation is like that. That's the accomplishing of actualization, accomplishing of, of differentiation. So, um, yeah, that, that's the that's the main thing that, that I'd say. Um, if you if you, you know, it, it's it's effectuation is individuation or is linked to individuation and incarnation. Nothing like this is important kind of more generally because this is my. Well, anybody who knows my work for a long period knows I have this certain beef against Bergson-inspired readings of Deleuze. And if you look at the, if you look at down the back of Bergsonism, fair enough, you will see Deleuze speaks about um, uh, actualization and, and embodiment or incarnation almost interchangeably. There's like four passages in Bergsonism where he basically says, the virtual is actualized, that is to say, incarnated. The, the English trans, the, the translation is embodied, but it's, it's incarnate, is the French. Um, but after Bergsonism, there's clearly indifference or repetition, and I think afterwards, this clear um, separation of the actualization of the virtual and the in, and incarnation, which is linked to individuation. So, so that's just the, the end of chapter four of difference or repetition onwards. And, and I think that continues. I, mean, I, I feel like I haven't done the work yet to see how this, this plays itself out in say a thousand plateaus where actualization and, and effectuation are both used. But, but I, I, I'm, I, I would need to get, that is part of, that's part of volume two. I still haven't finished volume one of this two volume study I'm trying to do. Um, but, but I think, I think, in, I think I, my suspicion is that you'd, you'd find a similar kind of a, a differentiation actualization effectuation in the later later text okay thank you yeah, yeah thank thanks for the question i i should say i would never i i would never consider myself good enough to translate a text <laughs> so this is not the criticism of someone who would ever consider himself you know competent to translate it fully a french text to english well, no, it's just it's a it's a it's a crucial point, you know. I mean, particularly with Deleuze, because um, so much comes down to um, the terminology uh, that he's dealing with when he's trying to address problems and therefore construct concepts. Uh, what are the concepts constructed on? I mean, it's it's the terms that he he's coming up with, and um, even in even in the French. Uh, it's it's 
difficult to sort out uh, without worrying, without trying to, you know, get at translations. Um, and in the translation process, French itself is so peculiar in some ways um, with the, um, uh, the uh, uh, direct, you know, like direct, I mean, if you're into translation, you get, get excited about um, direct object pronouns um, like I do, uh, masculine and feminine, you know, yeah. at that point, you don't know what he's even referring to yeah. uh, in a sentence. And so parsing out the sentences in French um, yeah. is already a challenge. So then in trying to figure out adjusting. So verb, so in, in your case, in your example, the verb uh, nuances um, uh, and, and add on top of the verb nuances, just as translation, the evolution of terminology over uh, a career, um, you know, starts getting uh, uh, even the layers get rather thick. Anyway, the, your translation is so clarified. I very helpful. It was very helpful for me and to understand, you know, actually, I think uh, it's not kind of which uh, translation right or not is a kind of, you know, the attitude to understand, you know, the mm -hmm. text. Really, you... really helpful. And then compared to other <laughs> translation and the polls and the yours is quite, you know, the nicely transmitted, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, it, it, the I don't know what Paul's stories are with his process in terms of the translation, mm -hmm. but the logic of sense translation was really ugly um, in the sense that um, the, I'll just name names, the Columbia, Columbia University Press mm -hmm. did a terrible job in terms of uh, commissioning uh, the translation. They did not commission the translation. A translation fell into their lap in 1984, 1985. That's why when you see the translation names on there, it's almost uh, like, you know, I don't want to say the Three Stooges, but nonetheless, you find this, there's a guy named Mark Lester who nobody knows, nobody's ever seen. And yet Mark Lester produced a translation of Logic of Sense and sent it to Columbia University Press. And so they didn't have the good sense to say, wait a minute, we didn't solicit this. Um, maybe we should go with a known quantity and start from scratch. They didn't do that. Um, and they made, I think the second mistake they made was sending it to me um, because I was an ambitious young French professor who didn't want to let go of this thing until I had it entirely corrected, at least as far as I was able to do so. And then after that, they weren't satisfied with the translation corrections. And so that's why it took from 1985 to 1990 for this thing to appear. And the only reason it uh, appeared was because Konstantin Bundes got involved. And the reason Konstantin Bundes got involved because he was working on something else for C Columbia University Press, um, the volume, the, the volume that he edited with Dorothea Olkowski. But that was, I, I wouldn't want to be so strong as to say he was uh, blackmailed, but nonetheless, uh, he was sort of let to understand that if he wanted this volume to appear, this translation needed to appear as well. And so he got involved in the editorial process of bringing out the, uh, finally bringing out the, the translation of Logic of Sense. And, um, you know, I found myself one day in January of 1990 or 1991 with a book in my mailbox, and it was the translation of Logic of Sense. No one at Columbia University Press had alerted me to the fact that this book was coming out. So it was like the process seemed to me so sideways, so wrong, um, that it made me begin to wonder how many other stories are out there that we don't know about concerning the, the different translations uh, of uh, the different books of Deleuze. But this one, I mean, you know, is just one that's uh, uh, amazing. And uh, I've, you know, uh, I, I've had many occasions to regret uh, getting involved at all. But uh, now, you know, at least I've been able to try to, uh, we had a chance to do it over again for the, because I don't know if you're aware, but there's a, there's a new translation 
of the logic of sense. It's not the Columbia University Press one, but it's another one that has been commissioned by Bloomsbury. And so mm-hmm. Bundes and I went through the original translation. It's not, and, and corrected it. It's not perfect, but at least it's, we, we made steps to try to look at uh, holes that had been left in the original one and to, to, to uh, correct things. So, you know, there's, it, it can, the story continues, in other words. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your effort to any. Yeah, yeah exactly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jason wouldn't know that. <laughs> right. So I think um, uh, uh, yeah. uh, there's the, the some can, uh, question can, on the yeah. chat. Yeah. yeah, Alex, do you want me to read it out or? Uh, yeah, yeah, the can be yeah. seen. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, good question. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, uh, uh, you know, Deleuze uh, the, the evaluated uh, Leibniz as a, a sort of philosophy of a system. That means uh, he does not actually the, agree, you know, that with what the Leibniz said is, but uh, she said the actual Leibniz uh, uh, made, you know, the philosophy as uh, explanation uh, for system. That means that the philosophy hasn't any role in the actual Leibniz, you know, the philosophy of system. That means the philosophy is kind of a servant, you know, for explaining uh, that kind of system. So, and then because actually, the, the, as for uh, Kant, you know, the Deleuze said, you know, the Kant made it, uh, Kant made the uh, philosophy as a tribunal of reason. That means a kind of a judge, you know, the, which one is right, which one is wrong, is uh, the philosophy is kind of a judge in the court. You know, that is what he explained, uh, the meaning of uh, philosophy in Kant. But uh, against these, you know, the, the Western the philosophy history, he uh, thought and he actually insisted that philosophy is kind of creation, creation of a concept. Is that is quite totally different, you know, the, from, you know, the, you know the, what the Leibniz said is a, uh, this, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, in, in terms of con- unconscious, in conscious, quite uh, the Freudian sense, but uh, he uh, read, uh, he read, uh, you know, Freud and uh, even Nietzsche um, quite different way, you know, from a uh, you know, very official interpretation. And then uh, yeah, if you allow me a more courageous, you know, uh, the, 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 the declaration, I think that the, the book song is a hidden master for Deleuze. And then because, uh, and, you know, the, I really uh, stand against, you know, actually the, such a new materialist interpretation of Deleuze. I don't think actually Deleuze is a vitalist. I don't think so. It's uh, uh, because uh, when, when, when Deleuze said in life, when the infinity, it doesn't mean some being, you know, it must be kind of uh, movement in Berg's song sense. You know, that's what I'm thinking. So, uh, is a uh, that means uh, you know, Deleuze always said, "Earth thinks, Earth, the uh, stone thinks." You know, that means uh, we don't think is a stone and the Earth. That is a kind of yesterday, Barbara, you know, talk about that is a milieu, milieu things. You know, it's not uh, you know subject, not in object think. You know, that's why in my, that's why I think I think you know Deleuze is not vitalist. Is a uh, if you said some biological, you know, the entity, you need actual subjective, you know. Do you know what I mean? Actually, the, you should actually, the, you know, the presuppose the subject and object. Otherwise, you cannot, you know, the understand, you know, the biological actual entity. So this is the reason why he uh, criticized positivism is following uh, Kabaye and the phenomenology as well. Yeah. That's my answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, Nathan might have something to say about that, especially on Bersonism. Um, and, um, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think just quickly, like, I think an, an interesting exercise, again, one of these things I need to do is, is kind of reinsert um, the structuralism essay back to where it was written, right? Which is because it's published after the logic of sense, but it's written before difference and repetition. And, and to kind of see, the the evolution, if I remember correctly, because I haven't looked at the structure of the essay in a long time, but the intensive is, isn't even mentioned in the essay. And, and so it, it appears as a depth phenomenon and difference of repetition, then suddenly it becomes a surface phenomenon, the logic of sense, and Deleuze in um, 
in what I, I guess is the Italian, the preface to the Italian translation of the logic of sense kind of suggests um, the problem with difference and repetition is it was too Kantian, this whole thing, it, it was involved, it, it was um, too enamored with the heights and the depths. And so the logic of sense, he tries to rediscover something by, by, or discover something by, by reconceiving everything along the surface. Um, you know, obviously there's also this, this distinction, the empty square, you know, becomes split into two things in the second and third uh, syntheses in, in uh, difference and repetition. And, th and then I suppose like you, you can kind of see, I mean, to me, what's going on in that whole period and, and before, um, Ed Kazarian, it, it, some of you might know, an, an American scholar, this was uh, his part of his PhD project many years ago, which was on Deleuze and psychoanalysis, had made this point that Deleuze's kind of um, attitude towards psychoanalysis in the 60s and, and early, and yeah, 60s, before Guattari, um, was still that um, he would be positive towards it insofar as it could be useful, in a sense, to get beyond it. And you could kind of see Deleuze both with psychoanalysis and structuralism in the 60s, with structuralism, that's what we're talking about, kind of trying to work through structuralism and maybe get beyond it, but within its own means, right? Um, and it's Guattari who comes along and says, you know, what you're really talking about is the machine, right? Um, I, I think, sorry, I, I just kind of skimmed, this is An Angelica's um, comment, just the very end, does the, does the empty square strengthen a sort of structure as Deleuze? Like it does until Guattari comes along and says, you're talking about machines, you're not talking about structure. So, yeah. Um, thanks, Nathan. I'm, I'm sorry I left myself. Um, uh, I didn't unmute myself, so I hope that didn't cause any problems. Um, uh, I think we can take one final question for uh, Dr. Chuang. Um, and there was uh, a question uh, for uh, Chun for Chun Mei in the comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's what question I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, by Sibyl and uh, who are speaking about the living and the non-living apparatus that a virus appears to be. I'm wondering what is the virtual content of the virus itself, apropos a technical object, object such as a vaccine? I, I couldn't say that. Uh, should I repeat? Should I repeat the question? Your father in the chat, so many things. Yeah. Can you repeat the question for me again? Because I couldn't yeah. find it. I'm sorry. Yeah. So Sybil asks, KV Sybil asks, speaking about the living and the non-living apparatus that a virus appears to be, I'm wondering what is the virtual content of the virus itself, apropos a technical object such as a vaccine? Vaccine? Oh, actually, because I, I was, I was going to talk about immunity and vaccination, but I, I was cut off. <laughs> okay. So immunity and vaccination are actually all about memory and anti-memory. Now by, in order to not get sick from the virus, we need to incorporate part of it. That's the idea of a vaccination, right? We either have this uh, message that causes the spike protein, or we have part of the spike protein, or uh, the other part of the virus to tell our immune system that this is the thing. Yeah. So, um, and I was going to uh, mention that uh, in 2020, um, Nobel uh, Awards for Chemistry, um, two chemists who discovered and developed a gene editing technology from the bacterial immune system, CRISPR, um, won the award. So CRISPR is this bacterial immune system that exactly do the same thing as vaccination, that he cut part of the bacterial phage that infect, infected that 
the, the bacteria and uh, put the message into its own genomes as like a, a library, a, a memory bank. Yeah. So this technology, of course, is uh, reacted by the bacterial phage with their own mechanism. So we are witnessing this um, back and forth, uh, like force and counter force in this co evolving force field in our planetary life. So, this is the so about living and non living. Actually, the question have no, cons, no consensus at all because you, you have. Uh, the, the traditional or classical definition of life, but every definition eventually or constantly encounters objections or, or exceptions. Yeah. So being alive, so the, defin the definition of life or being alive or have a life cannot be resolved by um, a by overgeneralize. So I, I think this is the point, another point of why we should resist the tendency of overcoding. We should always form rhizomes as a, a flight of a flight from overcoding to create more linkages, to look at more concrete interactions. A more concrete interaction of SARS-CoV-2 and human cells, the receptor. Because when you look at the concrete interaction, uh, it benefits the theory. Yeah, that's the, that's, that is my point. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 I'm not sure if this answered the question, but yeah. Right. Thank you, Chun um, uh, for that response. I think um, I think Sybil has his answer, um, and um, I think George uh, was beginning to formulate a question. But um, maybe George, if you want to um, kind of just ask it. Or has he been uh, disconnected? Yeah. You're not audible, George. Unmute, unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My question is to Nathan. I think uh, I, I have read one of his articles, especially Deleuze ontology. And uh, he, he says that, uh, of course, like uh, the essence of Deleuze's philosophy is not on difference or vitalism, but it's on sense. I mean, Sense is something about appearance. And uh, I think if, if I read it correctly, Deleuze holds that being is neither essence nor appearance, but rather sense, 
which is expressed through world's appearance and which includes the way this appearance seems to conceal another essential world. And my one doubt is what is this other essential world which appearance brings? Of course, like you speak about sense. But in another article, I think, where we say that which is not virtually is not the important, but it is, but it is the intensity. But if, if intensity, if we look at it with difference and repetition, I mean, the last part, the asymmetric synthesis of the sensible, I mean, that intensity just comes out of a spaceship. I mean, the reverberating spaceship, something, something deep inside. And if you argue on that side, like the, the reverberating spaceship or the depth, the real depth, is, is, is on which what we call like the, the or what we call the actualization of the space or whatever the intensity moving to space. So is there a contradiction there? On one side you say about surface appearance. On the other side you say it's not virtual, it's intensity. And intensity is something just comes out like that, the intensive spatial. So could you um, explain? Yeah. Is there is there a contradiction? I, I don't know. Is, is there a development in the way I, I mean in um in kind of my own understanding of this, probably, um, I think again, in intensity moves in, in difference from difference of repetition to logic of sense from a from a depth phenomenon to a surface phenomenon. It, it also, in a sense, in, in a way, moves from um, a, a, a kind of originary phenomenon to a derived. So, I mean, surfaces are constructed, therefore sense, and therefore intensity is constructed um, in 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 the logic of sense. Um, I think like that's one of the key issues in the reading of our toe in the in the logic of sense and, and then it changes again because the 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 body without organs in our toe gets reconceived post the encounter with Quatari. um so in, in anti-oedipus and, and and the thousand plateaus um i mean I, I think the 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 kind of genesis for deleuze of the notion of sense and, and fair enough it it, it doesn't I don't think it, it makes this formulation really into the logic of sense. I think that's kind of my the, my own development, my own thinking on this is um, it goes back to is, is to Hippolyte's reading of Hegel. Um, Hippolyte is the one who, who introduces the idea that that Hegel's ontology is an ontology of sense, because, but 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 an ontology of sense that doesn't that gets rid of the sense essence distinction. So sense is, is and and that the only um, the, the 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 idea that what's behind the curtain the, the secret is that behind the curtain there is no secret I mean that that's the secret is that appearance gives rise to the um, the uh, appearance so to speak that there's something behind it and, and I mean yeah that that's also in, you know possibly what what Deleuze gets critical of in in about difference and repetition and then the idea of intensity as a depth phenomenon but yeah I I, I mean Depth is, is meant to be rethought, not on extended spatial terms. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have the, the forget the virtual what matters is intensity. And, and I mean, I think that's because what, what I have kind of come to, again, kind of more recently in, in more recent papers, is that what's really going on with the virtual and sexualization, and I think this comes out for example, again, if you just look at the handful of times that the virtual gets mentioned in the logic of sense, the ver and, but but it's I think it's also prefigured in difference and repetition in the two different discussions, this chapter two and chapter four. So what the virtual concerns and its actualization concern is the ground of representation, which is unrepresentable itself because the ground has to be distinct from what it grounds. And but but it but it grounds representation, and Deleuze directly says that in his discussion of the virtual in the second synthesis of time, chapter two. So it's a ground that's that it's a ground of representation that's heterogeneous from what it grounds. So there has to be a connecting the two of them, the ground and what it grounds. And so the the, the grounding has to be accomplished, and, and so it's accomplished by way of intensity. And that's why you know, it's effectuated in that sense by, by way of in intensity and the way it unfolds. Um, and so that's why you know, I think intensity becomes more and more important. I, I, think it's, I think if you kind of look at the history of, of where the virtual comes. Now, I mean, I was asked about this um, in, in, uh, in the conference Alex um, 
organize Deleuze in Asia about the late writing of Deleuze's um, uh, of the virtually actual essay, which is in dialogues. And because somebody, whoever asked me said the late essay, I kept, I was going through the table of contents of the two regimes of madness in my head because I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. Um, and, and, and I mean, having said all these things that I've just said to you, um, I don't yet know how to integrate some of the comments that are formulated in that piece about the virtual and actual. Um, and, and at this point, all I can do is fall back and say, well, we're still just a draft paper. Um, but, but to me, I think that the, the, the general trend of Deleuze's thought is away from the virtual um, as a kind of ground of the kind of, of the, uh, as a ground of the kind of difference that a lot of the interpreters of Deleuze are, are getting from Deleuze. That what he's talking about isn't isn't a virtual difference, it's a tense of one. You this is a we had a fascinating paper today. I really liked it. Oh, thank, you. thank you. I look forward to read that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, the ESIC. Thank you. Um, with that, we come uh, to the end of this session. I will now relieve myself of uh, chairing duties and hand over uh, all of this responsibility to Manoj and, and George and all of the, the, the conference organizing team. Thank you so much for this, uh, for letting me be here and um, you know, for these wonderful, fantastic papers. Thank you. Thanks, Sandeep.